As Dr. Bukini mentioned, this is an uh, unusual uh, lecture or grand rounds that uh, I gave it in certain occasions nationally and internationally. And when Dr. Bukini heard about it, he said, we'd like to hear it. And, that's, and I'm honored to do that. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. It is not about a disease and treatments and pharmacology, but rather about a person who made science. And people who make exceptional science, we can imagine them in a certain way. And when we come close to them, we'll find them. They are really different from what we thought in them. Uh, so, and the person that I will talk about, I will reveal him later. But if we... All right, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't have any conflict of interest other than my love to this great man. Uh, my objective in this is that we learn from the life of a legendary scientist fostering role models in academic medicine and putting scientific integrity above personal gain. This person is unique from the very beginning to have a combined degrees from a great university at the age of 25. He had his pediatric residency and went to immunology fellowship at Rockefeller and joined the pediatric faculty at his own university in Minnesota as initially as an instructor and then one year assistant professor within two years as associate professor and within two years as professor of pediatrics microbiology and pathology. 1970 to 72 became the chairman of pathology at the University of Minnesota and he quickly became president of the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, large center, famous in the world, in New York, and professor at Cornell. In 82, he became head of the cancer research and professor of medicine at the University of Oklahoma, but it did not last long because the finances of the institution went down because of the problems with the oil at that time. So the dean at the University of South Florida, a very prominent person who knew him well, invited him to come there. He became professor of pediatrics, medicine, and microbiology, distinguished research professor, head of the allergy, immunology, rheumatology, bone marrow transplant section, was one section, all of them, and director of the allergy and another training program, Diagnostic Laboratory Immunology Fellowship. We had two programs at that time. If I just summarize in a few words, some major achievements for him. He discovered several and explained many primary immune deficiency disorders. He's the one who discovered the role of the thymus and discovered a syndrome thymoma with immunodeficiency that's later called good syndrome and the people of that caliber they never call it like that. They the other scientists they call the syndrome on their name. Same thing happened with my mentor that I was trained with, Douglas Heiner. He never allowed me to write Heiner syndrome when I was with him. But after I left him, I guess I was able to write it. But the humbleness of these great scientists, denial, self-denial. 
Dr. God uh, was a leader in transplantation immunology. He performed the first successful human bone marrow transplant in the world. Founded the National Bone Marrow Registry in, um, with the help of a congressman in Florida when that congressman had um, his family a child with leukemia. And Dr. Good told him what is going to cure her is to do a bone marrow transplantation and uh, were able to do it. So the congressman helped him in establishing the national registry that became later international registry for bone marrow. He was fascinated by the effect of nutrition on immunity. He always said the sentence that under nutrition, without malnutrition, is associated with better life and longer life. And the, although the person as grows in age will think about things related to the age, so immunology of aging was later in his research. He published more than 2,000 papers and chapters. And he was not just an honorary person, he was the center in any of these papers. Authored or edited 50 books got 13 honorary doctorate degrees from various universities in the States and the other countries, got more than 100 awards, had multiple lifetime achievements, and trained more than 300 physicians and scientists, most of whom became leaders in the, in the world. I don't think any of us can claim that we knew a person better than that, or her than that. And that is Dr. Robert Good. That uh, I enjoyed being with him for nine years, only when he became terminal that I, we, think all of us, jumped out of the boat because he was an institution, not the building. That, and uh, I moved here. 202, just when he became a terminal. Uh -oh. Yeah, okay. I mentioned that Dr. Good performed the first successful bone marrow transplant in human 1967. But I noticed that this year is a wonderful year. If any of you was born in that year, please raise your hand and you are allowed to leave my lecture. You are a very distinguished person. You don't have to go through it. Because during that year, other major breakthroughs happened. The first heart transplant in human was done in South Africa, Cape Town University by Christian Barnard, and the IgE discovery by Kimishika and Turu Ishizaka were in the University of Colorado at that time, and later moved to Hopkins, and Gunnari Hansen at the University of Uppsala in uh, Stockholm, done in the same year at the different ways. They discovered it, even they published their papers without the knowledge of each other first. And the beta-energic theory in atopic asthma was remarkably discovered by Andor Santivani, who was the dean on the University of South Florida, dean of medicine, who invited Dr. Good to come there. So there's some connection between giants here. Another thing, IgE, is a key in asthma and atopic diseases. And Christian Barnard died while he was in vacation in Cyprus from asthma, acute asthma. You see, a great scientist is not lacking to get the medication or education, but asthma can kill a person just in vacation. There, that is bad. I like this year. Again, if you are born that year, please, I will give you a dollar and go have coffee with it. 
My initial encounter with that great man was in 1976 while I was a fellow. And I remember very well it was in the Society of Pediatric Research in the Hilton Hotel in San Francisco. And my mentor told me, don't miss that lecture. I went a few minutes before it started, and I find that the poor room, the large room is packed, and the people are standing against the walls. And, uh, and encounter several people who knew Dr. Good said, we never forget the first time we heard him. It just has a special impact, the people that they come in contact with him. I was very, very privileged in 1983 that I was invited to a workshop in Lausanne. It was a closed meeting, about 30 people in it. And there were giant people there. Dr. Good is one of them. He was even spending some time in Japan. He came there. And uh, uh, people, great scientists, probably, you know, in immunology, Gilland Coombs, classification of hypersensitivity, and Robin Coombs was there, a great old man. And I felt me and another friend from the NIH, we were there, we were the youngest, and said, what are we doing here? We were waiting away, both of us, among the giant woman. What is this? We were just afraid to talk. It was great. Uh, this is the closest name because to, that I came in contact with Dr. Good because we were a small uh, group. Later, when I was in, in New Orleans, the LSU, the faculty, Tulane has an annual lectureship they invite, very prominent people. And Dr. Good was invitee in a certain year. And I told the fellows, let us finish the clinic quickly so that we hear this lecture. And went again earlier before the time, and the huge auditorium at Tulane was completely packed. Well, I entered from the back door, and I said, people were standing in the back. So I said, there must be a seat somewhere there. So I was walking in the corridor there, to look for that, Dr. Good was sitting with the other prominent professors at the front row. And uh, just, he looked inside and he stood. And he putting his eyes on me. So I looked in the back, who is looking to? And I find he's fixing them. Well, I didn't see him for years, except in that close. And the people, then when he shook hands with me, stood until I come to the front. I got a great respect from everybody later on. I was nobody before, but that, that oh yes. <laughs> who, who was that guy with Dr. Good stood from him to shake hands with him? He's a well, wonderful man. When he invited me in 1992 to give a lecture, I was elated because Anybody who just knows for Dr. Good giving a lecture somewhere will go, but I am to be invited by him, that is something exceeded expectations. And uh, after I gave my talk, he took me to his office and mm, kindly gave me an honorarium. I am supposed to pay a large honorarium for his inviting me, not that I receive. And he said, would well, like to join us. I said, me? Who am I? to join the giant with all his team and that. I said, no, we are known about immunology. We have, of course, allergy, but immunology is so high. And the people look at us just immunology. And the fellows just got tired of the bone marrow transplantations and various immune deficiencies. And they wanted to know more about asthma and drug allergy, food allergy, and all this. I said, I would be honored. But Dr. Good, if I come here, it will be for you. For how many years you're going to work? He said, I'm 70, I'm going to work until 75. He said, a deal. Those five years with you, that's wonderful. And you just, we live together. You retire and I go somewhere else. However, he stayed until his death, so I stayed nine years 
with him were wonderful uh, nine years. During those years, I learned a lot from him, not just the immunology, but the personal qualities that outsiders will not know about this great scientist. I learned from him that he learns from the patients more, although he published a lot of research, sophisticated things, but he called it the experiments of nature learned from the patient. Experiment of nature was a very famous word in his mouth. He valued teaching a lot, including one-on-one. -on -one. Many of his trainees were from other countries. They'd be trained and leave, got prominent positions out. Unfortunately, I did not do this with any single person. Say unfortunate. I was just limiting myself to the small circle that I lived in. He would be staying with a person coming from another country, barely speaking English, to produce wonderful research and publications from that uh, person. And they go back as leaders in their countries. And one time he mentioned this sentence that I framed, and it is in my office. Some of you are in my office, so it framed. You publish a paper. Only a few people see it. A fewer people read it. Much fewer remember it. And in a few years, you yourself forget it. That's the person who published more than 2,000 papers. They made a great science. You teach something, it propagates and multiplies. And this also affected me. That's why I framed it in my office. And I care a lot about teaching and giving product as physicians rather than papers for me. Uh, some memories, because before I left, I had the privilege that I got his permission to, to, to take some things from his files, from his secretary or from his wife. So I need a few things. So they allowed me to go through things and I selected some pictures and some written material. I, one of the lectures that I gave at an international meeting was recently, but I gave it a few times before, was at the World Asthma Allergen COPD Forum that the organizer asked me to give a lecture in honor of Dr. Robert Good in New York. During uh, that lecture, there was the editor of the Annals of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology. So after I finished, it said, can you write this up for the journal? And it was written also and was published last year. Uh, that man was born like anybody else in a small place, Crosby, the second of four sons. The father was a school principal and mother was a teacher. At five years of age, he watched his father die of cancer, an event that might be influencing his career to be fighting cancer. While as a teenager he developed a polio-like illness that affected his walking for life. During high school he had a morning newspaper route and saved his earnings for college expenses. Uh, these are qualities to come out from childhood. Although his parents had good positions, and they have enough money, but to go to, to sell newspapers before he goes to school, and in spite of his polio-like disease in him, that is something that speaks about the determination of a person. One of the pictures I took was when he was a baby. And I just wonder about putting the mouth and putting his index finger in his mouth. If you see any baby doing this, put that baby in your mind, going to be somebody. Because I encountered another person did that, who's the baby Ramses II, who became a great pharaoh later. Same sign. 
As a young boy, he liked school and books. In a high school that was written that he was distributing the Star Journal route in the Minnesota boy. And this uh, paper was written by his mother. He comes home whistling or singing. Books are forever with him. He says he has no hobby and yet he will deny himself food, clothing, and entertainment, en entertainment yes, to get the education he desires. Nowadays, most of our children reverse it. After they spend the money on entertainment, they ask, will I need to buy a book? But you have the money, but I used it for... So it will, entertainment is a priority, became there. 20 years old, finished three years pre-medicine at the University of Minnesota, senior in the college. This one of the pictures, and I put the caption on it, I think it's obvious, his love in medicine. At the age of 25, he got both degrees, and he joined the University of Minnesota in the Department of Pediatrics. He enjoyed the lab markedly. He's preparing his lecture. Those of you who enter my office and find it lousy, I just learned from Dr. Good that he'll make my, actually, I can make it organized, but I don't want so that I can appear like that as an impressive. <laughs> the same thing, the only one who exceeds me in this is Dr. Bocchini. Every time I, I enter his office, I feel good about myself. <laughs> I, I, I feel my, my office is more organized. That's good. <laughs> because at least my things are on shelves or on desks, but it isn't on the floor. <laughs> so that is, uh, this is a great scientist. Oh, he, of course, he deserved to be the president of the great Cancer Institute. And uh, this picture, and you see if you look at his face, so that this guy didn't sleep much. Now this is here. And the clock shows it is five to one. I think it is AM, not at middle of the day with that appearance. And some people who worked with him said he used to give us appointments starting at 5 in the morning. Well, how many hours does he sleep? If he starts 5 in the morning, give appointments so that by 8 o'clock, every one of the 200 scientists Sloan Kettering will be at their work at 8 o'clock. But those who are going to meet with him, every day have to come five o'clock to start to talk with him. Uh, there was a science writer joined him, Ralph Moss. He was in his early 30s at that time when he joined. And he wrote about him, said his day began well before sunrise. Friends, colleagues, and employees were expected to accommodate to his grueling schedule. I'm emphasizing the word grueling so that my fellows don't think they are being grueled. You are in luxury, guys. <laughs> I would travel the subway in the pre-dawn darkness to attend an early morning meeting in his office. He thought nothing of keeping people waiting hours to see him. I took this personally until the day I saw James Watson, the Nobel laureate cooling his heels in Good's outer office for a long time, for a couple of hours. And uh, he achieves a lot in one day, and just put these pictures together so that he's all over in the end of the day. He deserved to be on the cover magazine as the towards control of cancer. He kindly autographed this picture that I have in my office. Um, well, he was at the Sloan Kettering Institute and have 200 scientists. 
And one of him is doing an important experiment about transplantation between two genetically unrelated mice, black and white mice. And you want to know how the graft, how we treat the mice to accept a graft from a different species. So that guy was doing the experiment and it was published that we were able to put a skin from the black mouse into the white mouse. However, when the news came out and was a breakthrough, a technician noticed when she went to the animal facility early in the morning that this guy was painting a patch on the skin and first he made a cut in the skin without removing it and stitched the skin and painted this black. So it appeared it is a graft stitched there. So it was revealed and it was a bad thing in the history of the giant scientist. Although this guy was associate professor at that time in grade and published a lot. But the greediness science and the, the uh, just the, the false uh, desire to be famous. Uh, before that incident, Dr. Good was destined for the Nobel Prize. But Dr. Summerlin's mouse ate it because of that experiment only. The responsibility of a supervisor, although he's supervising at a very high level, he became responsible for what another person did in his institution without his knowledge in that. Uh, we have a small clip of a video, I hope it, it works. And this is from the science writer Ralph Moss. <coughs> can make it to uh, to work well, I'm not used to that the sophisticated technology yeah so it's coming up written in newspapers and magazines. Dr. president of the Institute, and I actually were discussing writing a book together. So we had dinner together. Well, anyone who knows about this, yes, please join come on. Socially, now here I was a 31, you know, at the bottom of the, really of the totem pole, and I was befriended by and friendly with the top person in the institute. Very heady stuff for a young science writer. Bob Good was the most, I think, to this day, the most published biologist in the world ever. I think uh, 1,200 papers. At Around the time that, that I was hired, he had this uh, terrible thing happen. One of his young associates, William Summerlin, had claimed that he could transplant tissue, skin, from one unrelated mouse to another unrelated mouse. And he proved this by allegedly taking skin from a black mouse, soaking it in some special solution, transplanting it onto a white mouse, and making it stick. And they demonstrated these mice all over the world. A lab a technician at Sloan Kettering noticed as they were going up to make one of these presentations, he was carrying the cages with the mice, and he thought, hmm, those uh, transplants look like they're in a slightly different place than they had been yesterday. And uh, 
he went back to the lab, he took some alcohol, rubbed on the transplants, and off they came. There was the white mouse underneath. A renowned research hospital, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, said today one of its scientists has admitted he put out phony research results. He's Dr. William Summerlin, 35, an expert in immunology. The review committee said Summerlin painted dark patches on the skin of two white mice, so it appeared he had successfully transplanted skin between animals genetically incompatible. And the Summerlin had had the audacity to actually paint these black splotches onto these white mice with a magic mar <laughs> magic marker. I mean, talk about nerve, you know. And here, Good had co-authored these papers. Good had promoted him, literally promoted him to be a full member of the Institute, which is like full professor. And the whole thing blew up in his face. I mean, of all ironies, of ironies, I walked in on this very flawed, very crisis-ridden institution. The day that I w found out I was gonna get the job, I was riding home, I, I lived in Brooklyn, and I was riding home on the subway, and I glanced over the shoulder of um, one of the other strap hangers on the subway, and I see mouse scandal rocks uh, Sloan Kettering, and I thought, oh no, <laughs> you know, my luck. <laughs> I just hired on, you know, as as the third mate on the Titanic. <laughs> That's how things started for me and kind of went downhill from there. Mm -hmm. Need to stop it now. Oh. Uh, no, but I wanted to go back. That's not, that's not your guy? No. <laughs> That's enough of it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, Dr. Summerlin disappeared right away about this incident. Just resigned and disappeared. I repeat, really nobody knew where he went. As I mentioned, my first job was at New Orleans at LSU. It was, I went to there in 78. And uh, I was invited to speak just within a few months of my arrival to speak in Homa. So I drove from New Orleans to Homa. But before I went, I said, well, let me see if any allergist in my way to visit to intrude myself as a new person in Tell us you. And we went to that person's office and waited until he took me to his inner office. And I looked on the wall and I saw the name. Oh my God. I am here in the office of William Summerlin. We're there. So the, my visit was very brief, <laughs> and I left. And that's the only time that I saw William Summerlin. He never came to a meeting in New Orleans. We had an annual allergy meeting. Never saw him in a national meeting anywhere at all, unfortunately. Yeah. So that incident Sloan Cantor affected Dr. Good markedly in his career and he was welcomed at the University of South Florida and uh, shortly after I joined him many people congratulated me that I joined him. One of them was his classmate, a roommate, Dr. Sheldon Siegel. He was professor at UCLA and past president of the American Academy of Allergy. Unfortunately, both of them, when I see this picture, and say both of them gone, I say the turn is for me to be written here, for me to. But uh, Dr. Siegel wrote to me, Robert is an old friend. I am certain that your exposure to him will be exceptionally stimulating, and I know you will enjoy working with him. Don't, however, try to put in the kind of hours that he puts in or you will begin to fall apart at the scenes. 
I have been falling apart with him without doing any of that either. <laughs> so that is, but that's the kind of, of people there. Well, it is frequently a misfortune to have very brilliant men in charge of affairs. They expect too much of ordinary men. One of the meetings that I was in Brazil, and we were in at the reception, and a, one of the speakers was a chairman of the pathology department somewhere in the United States. And I didn't know him. He came to me and said, may you tell Dr. Good your barber, say hello. I said, what? He repeated it. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, when I was a junior faculty under him, to guarantee to have time with him, I made a deal with him. I come to you periodically to cut your hair in your office, and I tell you about my research, and give me your advice. I saved your time, I talk. When I went back and told Dr. Good, he said, yes, that was true. Look at that. And my fellows are complaining of washing the car and cutting the grass. Get out of here. <laughs> what kind of fellows nowadays? No, none of them come to cut my hair. He is surely has an amazing combination that he received the highest honors, awards, and associated professionally and socially with the greatest people of the world. He cherished the memories, however, of making voluntary house calls to underprivileged patients under, uh, during his early years in Minnesota. Wow. A person like that can have it all from the bottom to the top to go home to the poor people who could not come to the clinic. He had hidden charities that I say hidden because I didn't know about it except once I found his car outside the building of the clinic. And when I went to the building in my office, I asked the secretary, said, so Dr. Good's car there in the middle of the day. And I said, yeah, he was waiting for his wife. His wife was PhD in the lab to come down and they go, they go every year to distribute food to poor people. I said, oh my God, I didn't know. That's a person who's publishing thousands of papers and developed science. So these other things that we don't know from outside. So find a person like that's leading and sharing and serving. Such so sharing he was so many times he gives me compliments that I don't deserve. And I see when I give a talk his writing, sitting in the front row and writing, and it just amazes me, what are you writing then? What am I saying anyway? And then later he say, well, you have a good, good lecture, and that's good slides. Uh, can I borrow a couple of them? You borrow a couple of my own slides? Wow, what an honor for me. So I said, I'm going to make a copy of all of them for you. How? And we never used one of them. He remembers, I got this slide, or this patient was dealt with Sammy Bad. It's so kind. Uh, 13 honorary doctoral degrees, multiple lifetime achievements. Featured on the Time magazine, he was honored by numerous organizations, the American <laughs> College of Allergy, American uh, College of Physicians, the American Pediatric Society, American Society for Blood and Bone Marrow, Thrive Foundation, New York Academy of Science, and this is just some of them. University of Minnesota Regent Professor, that's the very highest level to give. University of South Florida Distinguished Research Professor, the Lascar DeBakey Award for <coughs> Clinical Medical Research, uh, Gardner Foundation, uh, William Cooley Award, Japanese Patent Dec Decoration, conferring the Order of the Secretary, this is exact translation from the Japanese, uh, the Gold and Silver Star. One of his trainees, a Japanese guy, when he went back to Japan, he reached the ranks to be a president of a university. So just acknowledge his mentor that, and he invited him to get that highest 
honor on that. And in his last few years at USF, was they initiated the Robert Good Endowed Chair in Immunology. So he's a scientist. What he did was politicians, that is Humphrey from the same state, Minnesota, was a vice president of the United States, was Lyndon Johnson. He also was in the White House frequently discussing science, and this, and this meeting was about discussing the war on cancer. In addition to the President Nixon, he had the President of M.D. Anderson Center, as well as uh, a very rich lawyer uh, uh, who was an activist in the war on cancer. He was truly a pediatrician. He liked to see patients. And he was seeing patients like anybody else of us. He was not sitting high up in the tower. Uh, but he has life. He will go vacationing. How he finds time and do that? He fishes. He got trophies, big trophies. And what is he doing here? He's in Minnesota. He has a large land around his house, a farm. So he was in the farm. He's in truck. The great scientist has time and interest to do that. And I look at this and say, I am so dwarf. I'm so nothing. I'm unable to catch up with many little things in my life and look at the capacity of this guy. One time I asked him, what is your IQ? He said, it is not for publication. But you can see the similarity in the, in the features of these two guys. Uh, the newspapers loved this man all over. They're just always looking for something that he's doing. Uh, magazines and all of that is magnet to the press, whether television or newspapers. Uh, is a magnet for people, just whenever he's there, whether <coughs> scientific or social, but just people precipitate around him. Again, about the nutrition, undernutrition without malnutrition reduces morbidity and mortality. He was doing the experiments in mice. And he befriended the guy in Arizona who built the, uh, I forgot his name now. There. Japan confers, that's the, his mentor, as a student, and confers highest award and USF Professor Good for Education Science Achievements. And uh, this is a very expensive, well designed, here it is and there, uh, Order of the Sacred Treasure of Gold and Silver Star by the Emperor of Japan. And that's uh, Bill Young, the congressman in Florida, who helped him in establishing the bone marrow registry. Uh, the Allergy Asthma Foundation of America. And uh, I was privileged to nominate him for this excellence in healthcare lifetime achievement in there and here. Uh, when he completed the 50 years of career, made two celebrations, one in 1994, each was attended, it was closed meetings. Certain people only were invited. There's more than 400 in each of them. When I had an evening on the beach, socialization, everybody had the, prepared a, the T-shirt and written it, good guys, uh, immunology, and, and that. We had um, Tom Fleischer, here as a speaker, he's the current. No, he's the, no, he's the current now. 
president of the American Academy of Allergy. He was a few years ago here in my place, invited the speaker. And Mark Ballo is a past president of the American Academy of Allergy also. And uh, people just had in the second one also different kind of shirts written at good guys. And the many of the technicians in the labs put the face of Robert Good on, on them. But this is the true good guy. Just cool, good guy. No one has a wonderful personality. We are all Robert Good guys, yeah. Hmm. So he got the 50 years celebration, 94. And in doubt, chair started with one million that was matched by three quarter million by the university. And this is a symbolic chair of immunology that was given to Dr. Good. And this is part of the 400 in the evening or gather, part because we were gathering as a pyramidal way. But the, this picture, my camera couldn't get everybody here. And just this is who is who really in immunology in the world that came to attend their them and he's in the middle. Uh, lifetime achievements in various magazines written. And this an important guy. This is the person from Seattle who got the Nobel Prize in transplantation. He was one of the invited speakers. And when he stood up there, Dr. Good was at the head table, among others. And the media said, the Nobel Prize was supposed to be to this man. Very nice. Uh, that is Dr. Donald Thomas. Thomas, uh, he received 1991. He spoke graciously of Dr. Good's role in leading the way. That's the exact word that he said. And that it should have earned him the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Dr. Donald passed away also a few years ago. So a nice surprise was done. What we give Dr. Good in this celebration? During the celebration, Dr. Good was surprised by the appearance of David, the man on whom he performed this very successful bone marrow plant at five months of age. He's a, a pharmacist in Connecticut, and he was told to come with his sister. His sister was the donor of the bone marrow. And during a break, in the program, just they entered, and Dr. Good would just saw them in front of him. Oh, what a surprise that they hugged, and both of them were just so happy with that. And that is David, and that. Very healthy, normal, no one is thought. It's completely cured from a definitely fatal disease, severe combined immune deficiency. Uh, while I was there, we were uh, uh, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine faculty with him. That's the clinicians, apart from the lab personnel, which are many. But towards the end of his illness, only one, two clinical, and one, two, three, uh, PhD people only. When we found the man is just terminal, said he's the institution, and we, we left. His last request when he was dying, he was in the hospital, but he has said, I want to go home. He insisted and he was taken home in the same evening. He was deteriorating and they asked his wife, I want to see my students. So she called people in the evening, and they gathered around him. 
and while they were around him, he passed away, very emotional. A lot of papers wrote immediately about his death, whether in St. Peter's time, they wrote a lot. Cancer pioneer dies at 81. He was a fighter of cancer. Died from cancer. I uh, learned certain things during that illness because we had a morning conference and he told me, are you going to the clinic? Because I'm going to be late, I have an appointment with the gastroenterologist to make an endoscopy. I have a little pain in my, my stomach there. And he went and he, he came face down and said, he took a biopsy he doesn't know yet. And the second time went to know the result. He was, as a human, he was markedly sad when he was told in a less than professional way from a colleague that he has cancer. See, the guy just telling me as if it's a simple word. And yes, we use words in our that's simple. We take every word. We don't know the impact of it, even on a giant physician fighting cancer. The word is just a bullet came to them. And, uh, the, uh, the New York Times wrote about him. And USF, everywhere, written about, about that. In Minnesota, uh, a memorial service was done or children's, the uh, obituaries were written and the, by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology News, as well as in the uh, American College of Allergy, Asthma, News. Uh, a tribute was done at Rockefeller University, Immune Deficiency Foundation, Jeff Model Foundation of Immunology Research. So after his departure, he has a huge library, his books, scientific papers, all of them, many things, handwritten things, and professional correspondence were housed at the Center for the History of Medicine at Harvard University. In 2005, the Robert A. Good Immunology Society was founded, his name, and periodically holds symposia. And this is one of the covers for one of the symposia, Robert A. Good Immunology Society. And then the his library at Harvard, this painting was put with the, his material there. He has been called the father of modern immunology. He was a man. I shall not look upon his like again, and I mark the treasure my nine years uh, with him. Thank you for listening. Thank you. See how not only how much this person advanced science, but how much he touched the people who work with him. So Sam and that was very good. Um, any comments? Question? Yes. Uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture. A great man. I've been curious uh, every time you talk on this is what made him get into the bone marrow transplant? What was the basic science? research that led to the clinical application because there had to be some lab work to try an SCID patient. He uh, considered cancer is an aberration of the immune system. So to you want it, to get rid of cancer really is not surgery. Remove the cancer but change the factory that the immune system came from. So we find that after the bone marrow transplantation for immune deficiency and the uh, hematologic malignancies that spread into breast cancer and the other cancer, we were doing metabolic diseases also, which we did not think it is an immunologic, but many of the um, uh, the hereditary liver diseases, our 
first plan. I don't know more than that. The new system is, is a wonderful system. All right, if you no comments, thank you. Great presentation. Thank you.